so we're going to talk about our film, uh, Four-Eyed Monsters. Um, first, we're just going to talk about how um, scrappy we put the thing together, how amateur we really were about the whole uh, process of first making the film. You know, I have a background in doing video stuff, and Susan has a background in art, but um, we just decided, like, we're going to quit our jobs and, and make this movie um, because we felt like it, basically. <laughs> so we decided to uh, start really simple. Um, we didn't know how to turn what we wanted to do in a script, so we just uh, made a one-page outline. And then uh, we created a bunch of very crude storyboards that um, are unrecognizable now. As we look back at them, we don't even really know what they meant. Uh, and then we would plan a shoot and then just do that shoot that day and edit it that night. And if we didn't like it, we would start back up the next day. And our crews were always very small, um, shooting on uh, very small cameras with just a friend to help us out. Sometimes it was just two people working on it. And to sort out our edit of the film, we would put little stickies on the wall that represented a printout of the, uh, of the edit and somehow try and compile a final cut. And then eventually we did actually turn what we had shot into a script and use that to get um, other uh, cinematographers to help us shoot some of the scenes that we were both in. So towards the end we got a little bit uh, more serious about really making it um, mold into something that was something we were happy with. We found out that we had gotten into Slam Dance in late 2004 and it premiered in 2005 and we went out there of course with the hope that we would get some distribution deal of some kind that would get the film in theaters, on DVD, maybe in television, whatever, and of course totally failed to do that. Right, so um, we decided at our second film festival what we would do to sort of set our film aside from other films would be to um, do a daily video blog because we were told, okay, it's no longer your premiere, now you're just going to go to a bunch of film festivals and distributors are not necessarily going to notice what you're doing. Right, but the idea was to prove that you had an audience and prove that at each film festival people liked your film. We got a lot of interest in the film because of the daily video blog. We wanted to take that experience on a larger scale to find an audience for our film beyond just people wondering what's happening at that particular film festival. And we were fortunate enough that around the time we wanted to get started doing that, Apple uh, released a new version of the iPod, which you know they were bragging about could play video podcasts. This is our video podcast, episode zero. Episode zero. I was supposed to say that. I was just, but it might as well just go in one sentence. Video podcasts are short videos that we released online that are around the creation of our film. Even before we actually met each other, we were documenting the creation of our relationship. I see her happy with you. And I want that to continue. If the film failed, the relationship would surely fail. God, it's so sad that all that happened. It really is. So we decided to put 100% of our effort into making the film succeed and deal with the relationship later. There, and I just want to apologize. I don't care, Aaron. I, I, now, now I want to know how this is going to be fixed. No one from the film industry approached us, and the excitement was basically over. Now, one of the things that we had been told was that our film would be hard to market because there was no stars in it, it would be hard to find an audience for it. So the purpose of making kind of these online shorts that we felt were a demonstration of our filmmaking ability and um, related to the topic of the film was a way for us to actually build an audience because we figured if we have an audience then we have an audience to distribute to. So either we could work with a distributor or we could possibly self-distribute. Yeah, and um, it worked big time because all kinds of blogs and IndieWire and uh, even MySpace's homepage uh, gave us some exposure. Even the New York Times wrote about our first episode that we posted <laughs> Uh, saying that after just one week the material had been viewed by 14,000 internet users and the thing that was really interesting for us is we had you know just come from a you know nine months of traveling to tons of film festivals where sometimes there was just a couple people in the room but what's happened now is your podcasts have become really popular so now what we're at like about 60,000 viewers per episode and shows us how to get discovered using the web lucky for them Apple had just launched iPod video it was the makings of a real American high-tech success story <laughs> <laughs> but but more important in our minds than getting blogs and IndieWire and you know Fox 25 to talk about our project was the response that we got from our audience what's up world what's up Kremlin what's up vice hey I was up it's Corey from first star movies Hey there, MC here. My name is Mike Hedge. I'm from Los Angeles. I just want to tell you that I am pumped about episode 7. I'm really, really excited about the new episode of Four Eyed Monsters. 
Hopefully one day I'll see you movie in Miami somewhere. And I want you guys to come to Portland, Oregon. Let me know if there's anything I can do to help. Can't wait to see what the film looks like. Well, one of the, the interesting things about building an online audience is that you also have the ability to like get feedback from them and interact with them. And so for us, like it, it definitely influenced how we would make new episodes and it actually influenced how we would also edit the film, which hadn't been released yet. So we would continue to work on the film and sort of you know edit it based on how we saw people perceiving the work that we were doing. Yeah, and we really wanted to release the film because people kept messaging us like, where can I see this movie that you guys have made all of these uh, behind the scenes kind of you know, uh, episodes about? And, and a clear idea that came to the table as is, is an immediate action to take was to start collecting people's emails and their zip codes, knowing that we could sort through that information later and determine maybe where we could release our film theatrically. <laughs> And so you can see that as the months went, we um, collected more and more requests. And these little humps are basically every time we would post a new video, because the video kind of plugged at the end, at the end of an episode, hey, if you want to see our film, um, go to our website. Because keep in mind, we're in an environment that people don't necessarily go to the website of something that they're a huge fan of. People are subscribed through iTunes, through MySpace, through YouTube. Now the next thing that we did, which was pretty cool, was um, the IndieWire Undiscovered Gems Showcase. And we went ahead and did that, which um, you know we were invited to be a part of. And that was amazing, because this was the first time that we had our film screening in multiple locations after we had started the video podcast. And this gave us the opportunity to be like, well, these are all random places, but let's see where we have zip code and requests uh, for the film in these places, and send them messages to see what it would be like to send messages out to people and then see how many people come to the theater based on whether or not they you know, subscribe. Yeah, so here's a little clip on how it went. Invested in, in Susan and Aaron's people, even though I don't know them, it's kind of creepy. I was friends with you on MySpace. All of these people have a really, really good idea about who you are. I feel like I know you. I guess since I've been watching the podcast for a little while, I kind of like feel I had a connection. I don't know you, but I feel like I know you. And I shouted it out to everybody. I told all my friends about it. And I know that other people are doing the same because this shit is sold out. It's amazing. And I actually helped pass out some of their flyers all around the Lower East Side, a free side, and some in Harlem. Because of her. Friend Brian emailed me. There they are. There they are. It doesn't even matter at this point if the movie is good or not because I've seen everything <laughs> else that you guys have done up until this oh. point. Ten. Just for the cause. There's a chance that it could suck. I'm pretty optimistic based on what I've seen so far. So I don't know who I should give this to or who's collecting these now, but I could turn it in at this moment. It doesn't matter. People were laughing out loud and clapping. It was ridiculous. <laughs> And so what we learned from this experience was that approximately one requester to the film equaled a ticket sold. And we took this information and it gave us a lot of inspiration to move forward. Now the next thing that we did was we built this um, heart map. With Brian Charles, Yeah. Say. So we created a system where people could not only see that the requests were growing in their town, but they could also see, hey, who are these people? Maybe I'd be friends with them. So in a way, we're creating a sort of implicit social network around the people that are already into our film that haven't even seen it yet. And also the audience members become a part of the distribution story. Like they become involved with the story, which makes them partners in what we're doing. And, and because they could see um, on a daily basis how their city was growing in terms of requests, um, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because they see that it's growing and then they want it to make it grow more. So that gave us the confidence to launch our Thursdays in, in September uh, screening series. Just the idea that you could make it, you know, you could schedule things however you want in a digital environment. Um, but this was, uh, you know, something that we sort of had to make happen. And we hope that there will someday be a system. And we're starting to get there with what Emerging Pictures is doing. But um, we, we hope that there'll be a, a system where you could do this without any effort at all. It's just a system that exists.
allowing people to collectively decide we all want this movie to come to our city and then that movie getting booked is something that pretty much never happens. We started basically cold calling theaters that had been suggested to us in the six cities that had over 150 requests. And so what we're trying to propose is like, I know you guys are just scraping by, so are we, so is everybody in this theatrical broken system. We're trying to present some solutions on how it can be fixed. You know, you're crunching numbers at me and I, I don't know what to tell you. That's how the game's played though, what can I say? Okay. Um, Aaron got a little spit fiery with some of the theaters that it wasn't going too well with. We're considering giving up on the idea of self-distribution. Do you think if we came to you with a distributor, and if, it, if a distributor was having this conversation, it might be a little different? It would be a totally different uh, ball game. That's right. Well, obviously the game is a good game, and it works, and it's a great system, and everybody loves it. So let's stick with it until it really needs to be fixed. <laughs> or does it need to be fixed? Okay, uh, it looks like we can get Thursday showtimes, you know, prime time. Thanks to your requests, we've been able to book our film in six cities every Thursday in the month of September. LA, Chicago, New York, San Francisco, Seattle, Boston. In the month of September, we showed the film every Thursday at 8 p.m. When did you guys hear about it? On the internet. Did someone tell you about it? I read about it in IndieWire. I've been watching but, the podcast yep. for a while. Me too, I'm right there with you. You look really familiar <laughs> because you are on the podcast. You're all the way in the back. What are you doing back here? Uh, you know, I don't mind being one of the regulars. And we're happy to have you. Right? I wish I was savvy enough to make my own podcast. I mean, I like the suspense that they've created and it's like... I like the sense know, of family it's created. I feel like I know you because I've seen you. Well, like, we all feel like we all know but you But see, guys. that's that's the beauty and the and the tragedy of of this medium is that you really don't know shit about me. Walk up the sidewalk with colored chalk So you can hop everywhere instead of always having to take a walk Take the shortcut but it leaves a rut Both parties are found partying but she's the one called the slut We're all from guilty but refuse to take the blame And we're too weak to be unique and too scared to I don't know, I really felt connected to this wow. movie Doing the Thursdays in September, we were able to prove that our film does do well. 1,691 people saw the film during our Thursdays in September run. We just saw Fried Monsters. Yeah. More people kept coming, like every Thursday. The first Thursday, 318 people, then 353, then 499, and the final Thursday, 521. During September, the industry averaged seven people per screening. Meanwhile, Fried Monsters averaged 70 people per screening. So Cinema Village said, your film's doing really well. Why don't we open the film here? A dream come true. And then we got a sponsorship from Cashfly, which donated $5,000 for promotional supplies to promote a theatrical release that we did in New York City. And we uh, got teams of volunteers to poster the city. And uh, some of the posters stayed up six months later in certain neighborhoods that nobody else uh, had reposted it. The New York Times gave us a review. They had written about the film before, but not actually reviewed it. So now people started talking about the actual film, which is very uh, refreshing to us, that they weren't just talking about, oh, they've done something technically cool with whatever, but people were saying positive things about the film. And uh, we got nominated for two Spirit Awards, which we uh, previously um, were not eligible for because we hadn't done a, a proper theatrical release. And then we also uh, ended up being the first feature film to screen in Second Life. Welcome to the Foreign Monsters video podcast. Hi, this is... Um this is our little foray into Second Life. And we worked with the Sundance Channel and Electric Sheep Company um, to put that together. Did a Q&A afterwards. Again, it was a big eye-opener for sort of different ways to interact with the audience. It was fun. People were actually chatting throughout the movie and asking questions. And um, I don't know, people ask a lot more honest questions when they can type it out and you don't have to look at them and stuff like that. And you also answer, like, answer questions a lot more honestly and directly. So I loved screening it in Second Life. That was probably my favorite screening. And all of this momentum was causing really good things to happen. Um, we won the Undiscovered Gems Showcase, and then um, due to winning it, as um, Ira explained earlier, the winner of that showcase gets a theatrical release, so we decided to do um, 31 cities on Valentine's Day. So all of the film, uh, all of the cities that had more than 100 people request the film now got a screening booked, so that fulfilled um, the people who'd been working really hard to promote the film in each of those cities. And then we started selling the DVDs off of our uh, website. Uh, at this point, we were sort of at a loss as to how to get the film out there further, because we felt like as two people with Brian, a third person, like really pushing the film, we'd reached as many people as we were going to reach 
um, on our own in terms of building audience. So we decided like, what is the next step? What can we do to really like get more eyeballs like watching our entire feature film? Yeah, and while we're at it, is there any way that we can deal with this credit card issue? <laughs> oh because, yeah, we funded the film with credit cards, just yeah. so you know. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and you know, because we were making money. We made money through theatrical, um, which is not very common. Um, but And we were making money by selling the DVDs, but this was sort of like covering our expenses to keep our full-time operation going to keep pushing this thing. And we weren't eating away at the $100,000 of debt that we were in. So we were thinking, what can we do? How can we solve this problem? Does anybody actually know what we did? Yeah. What did we do? <laughs> What's that? I'll give you guys a hint. They were, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Hi, my name's Aaron. I'm Susan. And we have uploaded our entire feature film, Four Eyed Monsters, to YouTube. We wanted to put the film on YouTube, but we wanted to do so in such a way that we could create a cash machine out of doing so. But we wanted to put it online for free, we should say. Right, because we, we felt like our audience doesn't necessarily have uh, you know, credit cards, and even if they do, we didn't want them to take a big risk in watching the film because they've been watching our video podcast, which we were releasing freely for them to just enjoy. But unlike our video podcast, we wanted to release the film in such a way that rather than getting huge popularity and no return, we wanted to actually uh, see something come from that. What basically happened is we decided we wanted to do it. Um, YouTube said that they liked the film, they saw it on DVD, and that they wanted to feature it and provide ad revenue. Um, and then we knew that we had the asset of it being on YouTube and that it was going to reach a lot of eyeballs, so we wanted to get an additional, additional sponsor, um, sponsorship beyond the ad revenue that was going to come through YouTube. And it ended up being um, that Spout could uh, be the perfect people to do that. Go over to spout.com slash monsters and just join real quick. That gives us one dollar. It doesn't cost you anything because it's a free website. Right, up to a hundred thousand dollars, which would be like an enormous chunk of our credit card debt. So that little clip is what played um, before our film, sort of explaining to people that we will make money as people join Spout, and it worked. Um, and to date, we've gotten somewhere around forty-six thousand people to join uh, Spout. And if you add that to the um, ad revenue that came from YouTube, that's around fifty thousand dollars, which is much higher than any. TV deal that you can typically get as an independent uh, filmmaker in the States. So, um, you know, we to date we have uh, over 1 million views to the film. Uh, we saw a huge boost in DVD sales, and all this attention actually landed us a $100,000 broadcast and DVD uh, retail release. And um, it ignited interest in foreign marketers, which we're currently um, in discussions with to release the film in more places than North America. Hopefully, here. And, and hopefully we would love to bring the film to the UK. Um, so an interesting thing happened where um, if you look at the arc of, of how the views were growing, over a couple months we, we got almost 800,000 views. Um, and then we posted the film to MySpace, also being you know, the first to do that kind of a thing. And uh, saw another boost. Now if you look at people joining Spout, it's the same, um, pretty much the same arc right there. Um, because <laughs> essentially, it's, it's sort of a predictable thing. What it turns out is that 5% of the people that watch the film will engage in the sponsorship activity. And this is, this is interesting knowledge for other projects because if you've got a sponsorship that requires that the person actually do something, um, in our case, that's what we were able to count on um, consistently. And it puts us in a position where it doesn't matter how many views the film gets. In fact, the more views the film gets, the more... Um, uh, the more money that we make through Spout. And this is, a, this is a type of environment that I hope to see the entire film industry somehow evolve to, hopefully through subscription models. And then even in today's world where you have to rely on DVD sales, we even saw a boost in that. And that was very similar to the views. So again, the more views that our film gets, the more DVDs we sell. Which begs the question, why not have every single film that's for sale on DVD be available as a low quality uh, free viewing online, and why not use the most popular web platform out there, YouTube? Um, so where we're at now today is that our film is still available for free off of our um, website and will be at least through the end of uh, this year. Um, might temporarily not be there. Like Sarah said, we can turn it on, we can turn it off. It's completely up to us. We control our profiles. Um, we've also been translating the film into other languages. Um, here it is in French. 
and um, French is 86% of the way done, you can see on the side there. Uh, .sub is an amazing website that th and there's no reason that every filmmaker shouldn't be taking advantage of because you post your film on there and then just like Wikipedia, people can come in and voluntarily add, um, add information to it. So you can transcribe the film in English and in any other language that um, somebody is fluent in. Um, the film, of course, because it's on YouTube, it can be placed anywhere on the web and has been placed in thousands of places on the web, including our Spout page, uh, where anybody can come in and tag our film with various words. And the words that get tagged more often get larger. Uh, also, we got like, I don't know, 3,000 um, comments to the film on YouTube, most of them positive. But on Spout, people can actually write a blog post about your film. That goes on their blog, but it also shows up underneath your film as sort of a very, in, in some cases, very detailed, in-depth uh, review that all these people have written. Um, and so what else are we doing? We're, um, we're doing some stuff on our website, on our tutorial, designed just for filmmakers. Basically, anything that we've done, we post a tutorial on how to do that. So here's our little tutorial on distributing your videos on the web, showing some of the recent things that we found out about. Um, uh, we've got SusanBice.com, AaronCrumley.com is on here. Uh, we've got new episodes that we're working on. And um, we also did a, a video about internet neutrality, which is, I hope, um, a topic that we can address later today. And um, other than that, we've got our uh, DVD store going strong. Our website says how many DVDs we've sold, so anybody can see that and see how it goes up. It also shares how many downloads we've sold. Um, and we are in support of all of these um, DRM-free concepts. B-Side um, is powering our store here and providing our download sales, bside.com. And they also do our fulfillment for our DVD and our t-shirts and, and posters. And that allows us to have one store because a lot of solutions out there require you to make a store for your shirt, a store for your DVD, a def different store for your um, downloads. And because we have one store, we can do bundles. And bundles are one of the more popular ways that we, uh, we sell stuff off of our website. Um, so that's about it. Um, do we have time for any questions? Sure, we have five minutes for some questions. Do we have time for any questions? Sure, we have five minutes for some questions. How was, um, I have to admit, I, I am someone that comes from the uh, web. I'm not a filmmaking person. So my question to you is, mm -hmm. how hard was your learning curve from being filmmakers <laughs> to understanding the enormous power of the web? Who was the person that taught you all of those tricks? How did you find that about them? How well, did you become so knowledgeable? Here's, here's the person um, who taught us everything. It's called Google. You can search anything and find out how to do anything you need to know how to do. It does take some time, though. Um, I mean, I think the first thing that we realized is that we needed to build audience. And for our film, I think every film needs to figure out who their audience is and how they're going to find their audience. And for us, it was very clear that um, online interactivity was the best way in social networking. So the first thing we did was create a MySpace account. That was yeah. the very first thing we did. Yeah. And, you know, um, we get help when we need it. Um, we mentioned Brian Charles, who's here, mm -hmm. um, who's now working on the new John Sales film, uh, doing similar stuff, building out uh, the online presence of a film. And so whether it's a, f you know, but before we were working with Brian, we did a lot of this stuff our ourselves. And our friend Andrew Peterson, who, who did the score in our movie, decided that he was interested in the web and that he would learn a lot about this stuff too. So we just work with um, our various collaborators and we dig in there and we figure out how to do it. And when we don't know how to do something, it, it, it'd just be like with a camera. If we didn't know how to use a particular video camera, we would get you know an expert in there to uh, adjust the settings for us and get it just right. Um, I think that filmmaking has gone beyond just lighting and audio and picture and now you have to also think about connection to the audience and that's its whole realm of expertise and some films might um, have the budget for a hundred people doing that and some people might have to do it just with the one person yeah in front here hi um, I'm wondering how it works for you on the time management side between the creative and the business and also if you'd have been a lone practitioner how you would have seen that working or not working. Wait, what do you mean by lone practitioner? If you'd have just been one of you, um, right. as opposed to a, a pair. Well, I don't know. How do you feel about that? It, it sucks, I'll tell you. I mean, well, we're not here to tell you that, that it's always amazing to work on like 
either business or marketing type things. Yeah, no, it was a struggle. And for the past year, we've been mostly focused on the business side of things. But the reason we've dedicated so much time is we, we couldn't justify making another film with the amount of debt that we had, nor could we justify making another film just to watch it languish on the film festival circuit. Yeah. So we were trying to really pave the way to make um, a next film possible and hopefully easier. By building these tools, I don't think that we'll have to spend three years on the next film, like marketing it and positioning it. Now a lot of those things we can be doing as we're making the next film. Yeah, so. and, and I would love to see an environment that, that had virtually no friction. So, if, so it could basically automate it, automatically propagate itself. So that instead of people pushing something, the audience grabs a hold of it and carries it forward. And this is something that we experienced with the film being on YouTube. We were featured on the home page, to be fair. So yeah, we got 350,000 views from that. But since then, how did we get the rest of the 650,000 views? It's because people Word. organically mm -hmm. pass along the link to other people. And it takes a few months for this to happen, but I think in the future it's going to happen much quicker. And I think we will see a day in which a film blows up in its low-res version on the internet or on cell phones or whatever, and then because of its popularity and its cultural relevance to the particular audience that is attracted to it, it will come onto the big screen after having done that. As for us being like a twosome, <laughs> that definitely helps uh, us. I mean, that, but that's just the way that we work. I mean, M.Dot Strange <laughs> is a filmmaker who had his film in Sundance last year, and uh, he made the film basically alone in his bedroom. And yeah. um, he has like a, an, a YouTube channel, and he's very connected with his audience. So, I mean, he does it alone, pretty much. But it, but it is because he has an audience of people driving him, constantly sending him messages that he's cultivated, being like, I want to see your film. So it's like he can't let them down. So that's his driving force is, you know, wanting to get his work out and having, you know, an audience already built that's demanding it. And, and, and Lance is also a one-man powerhouse. Yeah, and he'll talk right. about his project in a second. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, back there. Hi guys, thanks for sharing your story. I think you've been really courageous and it's really inspiring. Uh, my name is Jack Guest. I've made a film called A Convenient Truth, which I would love to put online for free. Um, my question is, I'm in a similar boat having to repay a certain amount of money. How did you find your, your main sponsor, especially when you were like the first to do this? And um, it, mu you must have, it must have been really risky at that time. You were putting it online for free. You could have had a thousand people watch it and a big debt and the film gone. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you one difficult thing we had with trying to find a sponsor. We did try and uh, create a fixed amount that we could just get to guarantee, listen, you know, this is probably going to be great exposure. But what really helped was linking the sponsorship to an action. That reduced the risk that Spout had to take. Right. Spout's not taking much of a risk. It, there's all kinds of analysis in the web world that says what the value of a user is. So f somehow in their kind of bookkeeping, they've justified the value of a user at a dollar. So they, they can't lose, really. So I would suggest people... Right now, today, if you're going to try and do this in the next like month or two, or even maybe next six months, try and go with something like that, where it's um, an action that can be um, captured. Um, it's more risky as the filmmaker, but again, you have to lower the risk uh, of these sponsors. But what I would hope is that we don't have to uh, take sponsorship in the future. And I would even hope that we don't have to put little banners at the bottom of our videos when we're showing them for free, because I, I don't think, I don't really believe in push advertising. I think that advertising in the future is going to be just information. People go out and they need some information about what they're going to buy and they find out and make intelligent decisions. So I, I, I think we need a different solution than sponsorship for how we're going to fund the creation of culture in the future. And um, I think with people like Rick Rubin and Universal and Columbia Records talking about subscription models for the music industry, it's time that we all start talking about that for the film industry as well. If you had to do it all over again from scratch, Knowing what you know now, how would you do it differently? Uh, well, everything would be different. Yeah, we save that for the last. We save it to the last panel. Yeah, maybe yeah. Can I, I, say something about it's, that. It's a yeah, great sorry. comment. That basically that's yeah. the answer. We would do everything different. So basically, anything we've done, we just did it. You can't do it, but you can vary it. You can vary it, and we would vary everything that we do in the future yeah, based we, on what's going on and how everything's evolving and growing. Well, when we have our discussion with Lance, I think we're all going to be talking about how we will release our next project. So. Yeah. yeah, thank you guys. Absolutely.